uh, we can start. So welcome to this week Autonomy Talks. This week is a pleasure to have Yu Xiao Chen, who is a postdoctoral researcher from the California Institute of Technology, uh, specifically working with uh, Professor Aaron Ames and Professor Richard Murray. Um, before joining Caltech, he obtained a Bachelor of Science from Tsinghua University in 2013, and then a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Michigan in 2018. And his research is about uh, safety-critical autonomy and multi-agent systems, with particular applications such as autonomous vehicles, robotics, and power networks. Today, he's going to talk about some of his recent work on, to, on safe multi-agent autonomy, and we are very curious and, and happy to hear what he's going to talk about. So go ahead, Yuchao, the, the stage is yours. All right, thanks for the introduction. It's my great pleasure to be here um, and share some of my work. Uh, so let me start the, the presentation. Yeah, so today I'll talk about some of our, our recent work on, on safe multi-agent autonomy. And before I talk about it, uh, let me just first give some uh, acknowledgement to, to my advisors and, and collaborators over the years. Um, so, so there are a lot of uh, autonomous systems that involve multiple agents and they come in different forms. For example, the recent Mars rover Copter Duo that just landed on Mars where they use a heterogeneous robot team, where you have a copter for information gathering and you have a uh, rover to, to do the heavy lifting. Or you also have uh, homogeneous robots, such as the formation control for, uh, for drones or, or some other like swarm robot uh, applications. And then you have uh, autonomous systems that interact with human or human driving vehicles. For example, autonomous vehicle is a prevalent example of that. And, and you have network systems where uh, agents interact with each other uh, with a fixed topology and, and some uh, dynamic coupling. But unfortunately, um, despite our effort, right, autonomy still fails and sometimes it kills, like in the case of the Uber crash. And sometimes we, we, we worry about safety too much that uh, we divide, design something that's, that's too conservative. Like in the case, this Weibo car is stopping in, in front of the truck that is on a designated lane to do the left, to, to turn left, which, you know, as any human driver, we will know that there's no need to worry because this, this truck is uh, it, it, it would almost, almost surely turn left. And then uh, the multi-agent nature next actually makes it even more, tr even trickier because uh, there's dynamic coupling, for example, this, this uh, article talks about the recent uh, Texas uh, power crisis where it says it's, a, it's only very, it's only seconds and minutes from a catastrophic uh, month-long backout, because once you have a contact contingency in one of your nodes, it can it can trigger the contingency in the neighbor nodes uh, via the, the dynamic coupling and then causing something called cascading failure, which is, is quite bad. So um, so why is safety since it's so important? Why is it so hard? Uh, so typically, as control or, or robotic people, we we typically model it as a as you know, as an ordinary differential equation where you have state input and disturbance. And typically we can write down the safety constraint as some sort of uh, safe set, we call it C. Uh, but if you look at this example of Boston Dynamics where you can see if this safety constraint is just to keep the robot upright, at this moment it's still satisfying the con condition, but then it's already reaching a point of no return. So in other words, there are certain points in your safe set that is inept will inevitably leave the safe set. So what we need is not only a safe set, but also a control invariant set, which has been featured in the, in the literature with different names like uh, uh, viability of kernel or infinitely reachable set by Bertikas. Uh, and I, I'll use the name control invariant set. So basically it's a set such that there exists a controller that keeps any trajectory starting in the set within the set indefinitely. And once you have a set like this, you can, you know, uh, keep your, your, your system always, keep your state always inside the set and, and, and therefore uh, guarantee safety. But unfortunately, this set is notoriously difficult to compute and there's no generic method that can scale well. So um, there are a lot of methods existing, for example, the famous uh, Hammond Jacobi uh, Bellman. And also, we have developed quite a few methods like the polar algorithms that, that is applied to uh, low, low speed autonomous vehicles for ops avoidance. Also, we have this data driven uh, linear. A robust linear programming approach that um, uh, can directly compute uh, control environment set from, from data. And also we have density functions that gives you the optimal safe controller. And once you have that, right, there are multiple ways to implement that. For example, uh, 
You can do uh, model predictive control where you use the control environment as your terminal constraint. I'm sure some, many of you are familiar with this. Also, you can do a switching controller that switches to a safety controller when you are near the boundary of this control environment set. And also you can do the control barrier functions, which is sort of the specialty of, of my lab, of Aaron's lab, where the idea is that you have a dynamic system, you have a legacy controller that gives you some kind of U0, which is not uh, you know, safety ensuring. And then you add on top of that a supervisory controller that fill, acts as a safety filter. Uh, and then the idea here is that if you're uh, control environment set is just uh, it's a zero level set or some function h, which we call control barrier function. Then you simply do this CBFQP where you're minimizing the difference between u and u zero. So it's like when u zero satisfies this condition called CBF condition, then you simply put u equal to u zero. And if not, if if it does not, then you uh, find a minimum intervention such that this CBF condition is true. So the CBF condition is simply it's a very simple condition where this alpha is called a class K function. So it's monotonically increasing and pass through the origin. And what it does is that when your system is inside the safety, uh, the safe control environment set, then uh, this condition simply says you cannot leave uh, S. And when it's outside, it's forcing your state to converge back, at, back to S exponentially. So one example is this uh, experiment we did in Michigan where we install a secondary steering wheel. It's kind of like a chauffeur guardian system in, T, uh, in Toyota Research Institute, but we actually did it independently. And then of course, we kind of did it in, in, on a PhD engineering level. Uh, so, so in this case, actually U0 is just me. So I'm, I'm controlling the secondary steering wheel and I'm actually being a pretty bad uh, um, legacy controller in the sense that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to steer the vehicle outside the lane, but the CBFQP is keeping myself inside the lane. Um, so in this case, because we have a control environment set, so this CF CBFQB is always guaranteed to be feasible. Um, so what happens when we move towards multi-agent system, right? Uh, we've had some success with the, this relatively simple uh, dynamics. So obviously one thing we quickly re realize is that no agent alone can guarantee safety because the other agent can just do something crazy and then, and then you know, you're, you're in, a, in a situation that, that is impossible to guarantee safety. So what we need is some kind of interaction protocol between the agents so that together um, they, can, they can provide some kind of safety guarantee. And uh, uh, I'll talk about two main um, parts or, or two main categories of the problems that we, we try to solve. The first part is uh, when you have control over all the agents, for example, the, in the power system example, or in the case of Swarm Robot, you, where you design what's the controller to drive each, each robot, we call it collaborative, uh, cooperative case, in which case we typically do the model-based uh, contract design. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the detail later. And the second case is, for example, in autonomous driving or, or this kind of servant robot where your robot, your autonomy is, is uh, interacting with some agents that you don't have control over, for example, human users, where obviously you cannot give orders to human. We call it non-cooperative case where we typically do data-driven reactive modeling. Uh, so let's start with the cooperative case. Um, so if you look at the, the literature, you can find a lot of uh, papers or uh, works on, on, on multi-agent consensus, on, on formation control, network control, but what about multi-agent safety, right? You don't see a lot, and there is a reason behind it. If you look at the, the scalability of the, the popular methods that I list, for example, sum of squares, Hamilton Jacobi, and polytopic methods, they're not very good, and they're, they're actually pretty bad, right? Uh, some can scale to, for, say 10 dimensional top, but most of them can only, only scale to four to five to say dimension. Uh, so if you, if you look at the capability of these computation methods, there's no hope it can scale to say a, 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 convex, a, a complicated uh, uh, power networks or, or a swarm robots where you have at least right, 20, 30 uh, agents. Uh, it's, it's way beyond its, its uh, maximum capability. So we found out uh, over the years is that you actually need a perpendicular uh, direction of, of research, which is what we call it interaction protocol, where it basically decomposes the multi-agent systems into individual agents by, by reasoning about the interaction between, between uh, the a particular agent and its neighbors. Um, and with that, we can actually handle the total complexity. 
by, by basically multiplying the two directions. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with the power system example. Well, uh, basically we were, we were contacted by, by the Pacific uh, Northwest uh, National Lab. And then they said, hey, uh, we want you to prevent large frequency deviation because once, you, once that happens, it, it may cause some kind of blackout like in the case of the, of the Texas power crisis this year. Um, and then immediately we thought, okay, um, if you look at individual nodes, the, the, the dynamics can be modeled in a very simple way. You only consider two states, the frequency and then the trace angle theta. And then immediately we say, okay, let's just compute a robust control environment cell, which is, uh, lies inside the, the frequency deviation bound that you specify. And then we, you know, we can prevent uh, 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 large frequency de deviation. But of course, it's, it's not feasible to do that because there's coupling between neighboring buses. So the idea is that once you have different um, phase angle between uh, the neighboring buses, there will be power flow uh, that flows from the, the bus with a higher, uh, uh, higher uh, uh, phase angle to the node with the lower phase angle. So in other words, if you don't specify the behavior of your neighbors, you, can, you cannot even bound this, this PIJ, this, this coupling power flow. So, if you want a computer or else control environment, and then you don't even have a, uh, you don't even have a bound on your on a disturbance. Obviously, it's a, it's a mission impossible. But if you consider the whole network system as a whole, then no method can scale to the dimension of the whole uh, power network. So what we do is actually we draw some some idea from from the CS community, where they study this this assumed guarantee contract, and the idea is that you each component in the system assumes something about the other components. And then what they do is they say, okay, if the assumptions are true, then I'll guarantee that my behavior will abide by some guarantee, which is also a specification. And, and then this, this guarantee is then used by other components in the, in the, in the system as, as assumption. So it's kind of like a, a double way, a double direction uh, uh, specification sort of exchange. And then to put it in English, in, in, the, in the case of power networks, it, it basically means if my neighbors can keep their face angles close to the set point, then I can keep my face angle near the set point as well. Okay, and then to do this, let's start with some uh, assumptions. So this is an assumption about the neighbors and saying my neighbors, uh, so we, we use NI to denote the set of neighbors for, for the i's node. We say the face angle of my neighbors are bounded by some parameter theta NI max. And then once we assume that we have bounded coupling disturbance, and then we can actually compute a robust control asset because now we have a situation where we have bounded uh, uh, disturbance. And we actually use this robust linear programming approach that we actually originally designed for, for vehicles and actually we just directly apply to, um, to power networks because dynamics is quite simple. Uh, now we have a control environment and notice that we now project on a different direction. So previously I showed that we can actually use this SI to bound omega, but now we are using it to bound theta i because now we need a guarantee, which is the phase, phase angle deviation of the ith node. So then, then that gives us the phase angle deviation of the ith node. Uh, this is a guarantee uh, a parameter. And we, then we can actually define a lambda i, which is a local mapping from the parameter for the assumption to the parameter of, of the guarantee, uh, like this. We simply do this projection uh, given this SI. Um, and then we basically define a network assumed guarantee contract, which we just stack all the contract for each node like this. And then we say that a network assumed guarantee contract is valid if the conjunction of all this guarantee is stronger than the conjunction of its, of its uh, assumption. And if this is true, then all the assumptions and guarantees are true. So to illustrate this idea, let's consider this very simple uh, three node uh, network where, uh, for example, we start with, with assumptions like theta one, theta two, theta three max. This is the assumption which, which is saying the, the bound of the, of the face angle. And then if you look at the, uh, the, the first node, uh, we use this procedure, then we can basically define this lambda one, which is the local mapping. And then we take in the, the neighbor's uh, bound, which is theta two max and theta three max, because the neighbors are two and three. Then we get uh, the, 
the, the guarantee for, for node one. And then we do the same for, for, the, for the other two nodes. And then we get these guarantee uh, parameter. So if this guarantee parameter is smaller than the assumption parameter, which means they're stronger, right? Because the, the specification is saying the phase angle deviation is bounded by this. So a smaller one means a, a stronger um, specification. Then we know that this, this assumed guarantee contract is valid. Uh, so to put it compactly, this simply means lambda i of the assumption uh, parameter is smaller than the than than the assumption uh, parameter uh, because you, you see that there's this this, this cyclic uh, structure. So this is simply a, a condition on uh, the 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 assumption parameter alone because this guy is simply the the guarantee parameter. And once we have that, we have a theorem that says any valid network assuming guarantee contract will lead to a robust contrarian mindset for the whole network system. Now, how do we find such a valid assuming guarantee contract? Well, we actually turn this algebraic uh, condition to a geometric one by considering the epigraph of this lambda i, this, this local mapping. Uh, and where this lambda i, uh, this epigraph is simply the, the area above the graph of lambda i. So if if this epigraph can be uh, approximated by, say, uh, a, a, a convex set or the unit of some convex set, we can actually use convex optimization or you know, mixed integer programming to just search for a valid contract. And once we have a valid contract, right, we, um, we have a robust contrarian set, and then we can actually use CDF, a kind of function, to uh, guarantee that all the face angle and, uh, and, and, and the frequency is, is bounded by the specification. That provides us with a safety guarantee. So let's let's sort of recap what's what's going on here. So now we have uh, a, net, a power network system where it's it's in the form of a network system with a lot of uh, uh, agents, and they have a dynamic coupling. And because of this complexity, we cannot uh, guarantee safety. And then we use contract basically is single out one agent by uh, isolate that isolate it from from its neighbors. And then we view all the coupling from the neighbors as disturbance, but we cannot handle all disturbance possible because it might be too strong. So we do this assume guarantee contract and saying, oh, uh, your the neighbor's behavior then becomes disturbance and we cannot handle the, the whole thing. So we use contract and say, uh, you know, we, we can handle part of that and you have to remove the part that, that is too dangerous for me, just too, too hard to handle. And in turn, I'll, I'll actually show that I will um, also exclude some of our behavior that's too dangerous to you. And then that will become your assume, assumption to use. And that's basically the idea of the local mapping lambda i. And then we step out, sorry, step back, and then look at the whole net network system. And then we use uh, the epigraph optimization to find the value contract. Um, so now, of course, this works for probably similar system with, with a fixed topology. What about? swarm robots where you don't have a fixed topology and agents tend to move around like this and then you don't even have a fixed set of, of neighbors. Well, it turns out we can use a similar philosophy but with different implementation and then also get the same similar results. And this is the idea of the backup strategy approach and this is the second story I wanna talk about today. Um, and let, to, to talk about that, let's, let's first look at this simple observation where uh, as before, we have some safe set C that we want our system to stay in, and then actually it's characterized as the, the zero level set of some function AC. And I mentioned before that computing a, a, a controlling value set inside C is, is difficult, especially for a complex system. But it's usually easy uh, to get some controlling value set that are super small. Right? Um, for example, we can do linearization of the dynamics um, or, or Later, I'll actually show a, a trivial way to obtain a control invariant set. So, so this is this is S zero, which is a control invariant set, but it's super small that it's hardly usable, right? And then what we'll show is that if we fix a backup policy, right? This pi is just any policy that maps the state to some controller uh, to some control input, and then we look at all the initial condition uh, that can be driven to this S zero following this f pi, which is the closed loop dynamics under the backup policy pi. And then we say for all the initial condition that can be driven to S0 with the, the whole trajectory contained in C, 
then the, all these initial conditions forms a control invariant set. It's a larger control invariant set contained in C and contains S0. Um, and then we call this uh, control invariant set, this larger control invariant set S. Uh, so it can actually be defined as the zero level set of this function where this uh, phi uh, f pi is simply the flow map of, of f pi, okay? Uh, which is not surprising actually, because uh, you know if you're inside S, then you can simply just, just use the, the backup policy and then you will be driven to S zero. And then in the meantime, you'll always stay inside S. And also, once you're, once you're inside S0, you're already inside a small controller as S0. So, so by definition, there exists a controller that keeps you inside S0 forever. So by definition, right, the, the, the state stay, stays inside S. OK, so we can actually use this directly in our CBFQP. I will, I will talk about detail, but basically, we use chain rule and sensitivity Jacobian, which is basically the, the partial derivative of this flow map uh, that we can implement online to evaluate this h dot and then we can we can actually uh, put this whole all thing whole thing together in the, in the, in the online way and then and then directly use cbfqp to enforce the state to stay inside uh, this this larger control invariant set s uh, forever um, and to implement this oh sorry I have to, actually I'll, I'll talk about a little, a little about the, the implementation so if you look at the backup uh, control barrel function here this is defined Using the flow map, right? So it basically saying after capital T time, um, you know, after the, uh, following the flow map, the, the state will end up in S0. And also uh, for all T inside uh, within uh, zero to capital T, it's inside this, this uh, safe set C. And then we'll write down this uh, control variable function H like this. And then the CBF condition becomes this, where this is where the sensitivity Jacobian comes into play. So basically, we use the chain rule, which is direct, uh, differentiating HC and HCS. And then this is the sensitivity Jacobian where we can show that this, uh, it can be solved with this uh, matrix on uh, ordinate differential equation. Uh, and here's an illustration of what's going on here. So consider, imagine your, your backup policy is just the simple linear dynamics that, that converges to the origin. Um, then this is the initial condition. Right, it's not following the backup policy because the backup policy is actually the, the blue trajectory. And if we fix capital T to be four seconds and eight seconds, then the state following the backup policy end up here and here. So the sensitive Jacobian simply means the sensitive the, the Jacobian with, of these two states with respect to the current state. And it can be evaluated with, with this uh, matrix ODE. And then we have this theorem that says for any control affine dynamic system, it can be nonlinear. Uh, the CBF condition is always alpha in U uh, uh, with the sensitivity, sensitivity Jacobian. And for any S, X inside the safe, the control environment set, the CBF QP is always feasible. Uh, because we can show that we simply take U equal to back to the backup policy, we'll render H dot equal to zero. And because once we're inside X, inside S, this uh, H is uh, non-negative, so this is already a, a feasible solution to this CBFQP. So let's look at some, uh, how do we apply this actually? So first we have to find the small control events as zero to begin with, right? And then it turns out any stabilizable equilibrium point is a valid as zero because, you know, by definition, if it's an equilibrium point, you can stay there forever and therefore it's a control event set, right? This is a trivial one, but it's a it's a it's a valid one to use. Uh, so, for example, if you consider this Dubin's car example, uh, the the safe the safe side is simply you know your 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 position has to stay outside some some dangerous x d. Then your x zero then your s zero is simply the same condition plus an addition condition that uh, v has to be zero. Uh, same same thing if you if you consider quad rotor right you have some Fairly complicated dynamics, uh, nonlinear. Um, you define a, a safe set C, and then you simply add the condition that the translation and, and rotation velocity are all zero. And then the backup policy is simply any uh, backup pol uh, feedback policy um, that maps uh, state to, to, to control input. Uh, and in this particular case, we actually require that it brings the robot to a stop because eventually we want the backup policy to bring the state to, to this S0, which is essentially the stopping case. Right? And it can be PID, can be LQR or MPC. And here we show some example 
of uh, the CBFQP in action. So this is a raw simulation where we have a, um, a, a quad rotor and, and we want to avoid the wall of the maze. And we actually use the, the LIDAR point cloud uh, to detect the, the wall. And this is showing the safety filter in the form of a CBFQP. Uh, actually, you can see this, this kind of moving frame, which is the, actually the integration of the backup policy. So this is the trajectory of, of, the, of the backup policy. Uh, and what's really cool about this, this, this backup CBF approach is that it can be directly applied to, to multi-agent systems via a, a single guaranteed contract. And let me show you how. So if you consider a multi-agent system where you have basically, you know, each agent has a copy of, of, the, of, the, of the state. And, and if you look at these two examples, again, the, the Dubin's car example and the co example, we have uh, um, a, fair, um, a little bit more complicated uh, C where we also will require, you know, pairwise uh, opposite avoidance, right? So each uh, two agents has to stay, maintain a, a minimum distance of, of a radius R. And then you simply define your S0 to be the C plus the same condition where each, can, each agent has to come to a stop. And similarly for, uh, for the quarter as well. So it turns out the CBFQP, we, we proved that the CBFQP can be solved by, for this multi-agent system in a, decentrally, in a decentralized way without any communication and it's guaranteed to be feasible uh, it, as long as the initial condition is inside. Uh, just, uh, the control minus S. And let me show you why this is true. So if you write down the CBFQP for agent I, and you can see this is a, a fairly complicated uh, expression, but let me just remind you that this CBFQP contains UI, which is the, uh, the control input for the agent I, which we can control, but it also con con contains UJ, which uh, is the input of, of its neighbors. So at this form, this VFQP cannot be solved by agent I alone because it requires information about its neighbors. So what we'll do is we we'll just simply ignore this term and, and assume it's, it's zero. And, and now we can solve this VFQP because it's only a function uh, of UI. And it turns out, uh, you know, as at, with, with a similar argument, uh, pi I, which is the, the backup policy of agent I, is always a feed solution. solution for this uh, CBFQP, as long as this uh, HIJ is, is positive, because we can simply input, input that and, and the whole you know, uh, derivative term becomes zero, then this is a, a valid solution. And let's look, at, look back at the, at the term that we ignored. Well, it turns out, although it's not zero, but because every agent is solving a similar uh, CBFQP, so Agent J is also solving a similar CBFQP. So it actually provides an upper bound for this term that we ignored. So this term is actually upper bounded by minus alpha of HIJ. So because we do this for all agents, we can actually prove that H dot plus two times alpha of H is positive because one comes from agent I and one comes from agent J. And this is true for every two agents. And remember that the collision avoidance is defined in a pairwise fashion. So Every collision avoidance uh, constraint concerns two agents. And therefore we have this two here. And remember alpha is a class K function. So two alpha is also a class K function. And this is a valid CBF condition that gives you, uh, you know, safety guarantee. And this is exactly the, the back, the, the assume we get guaranteed contract idea where, you know, each agent alone cannot guarantee safety, but if we can show that each agent will not do something that's too dangerous for the other agents, then together they can actually guarantee safety. Uh, so this is demonstrated with uh, this robotarium example where we have robots. Remember, there's no communication here. Uh, everything is, is fully decentralized, but they can guarantee no collision avoidance. And also we have this uh, quad rotor example, um, you know, where, where, we, where implementing this CBFQP online uh, and, and avoid uh, collision. And in theory, this, this, can, uh, you know, this can be extended to, to a really large number of agents because remember all the CBFQP cares about is only local information. So it's only, it only look at its neighbors and then, and then do the CBFQP. So, and everything is decentralized without communication. So uh, you know, theoretically it can, it can, it can be uh, scaled to, to arbitrary number of agents. And then we have some extensions of this. For example, 
Previously, I mentioned that the CPFQP is guaranteed to be feasible, but this is only true if you have uh, the CPF to starting with a non-negative non uh, value. Uh, but in some cases, right, uh, you can actually have a CPF starting with um, a negative error value when you, and in, in, in which case you actually require communication to resolve the conflict. For example, in this case, we consider this merging problem uh, where vehicles merging in and then they can start with a negative CPF. And we, we, we propose this ADMM approach and we show that it performs as well as a centralized controller. It's still decentralized, but with communication. Uh, and also there's some computation issue, um, especially when, when you try to uh, evaluate this sensitivity to Jacobian because it can, it can uh, it scales quadratically with, with the state dimension. Uh, so the first approach we propose is that we can learn a Kuhlman operator. And the idea is that uh, if your backup policy turns out to be a linear one, then your, your sensitive Jacobian is simply a matrix. So you can, you can simply do a matrix multiplication and this can be computed offline. So we basically do a Kuhlman, a Kuhlman learning to lift the nonlinear dynamics of the, of, the, of the system to a, a higher space and then learn a, a linear dynamics. And then everything becomes linear. So this can make, with this, the CVFQP can, can be evaluated in, a, in, in milliseconds. And this is showing the quality example. And what, one more benefit of this is that it can capture the on-model dynamics because the Kuhn operator is learned from data. So for example, for drones, you have this ground effect and it can be very nicely uh, captured here. So this is showing the difference between you know, incorporating the ground effect versus not incorporating the ground effect. And also you can train a neural network that you know, bake this CVF uh, condition uh, into the training. Here we're showing, uh, with a neural network, we can actually control, let me just show you like more than a thousand ground robots and more than a thousand drones uh, in, in a single computer uh, in real time. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool how, how scalable these things can be. And, and you can shoot, see that these uh, robots are, are moving towards their destination shown as the, the gray region and they're avoiding collision. And also, you know, this, this, this backup policy basically translates a set problem to a trajectory problem. So we can utilize all the machinery set that we developed for, for trajectory tracking and talk about um, uh, robustness. For example, we show that we can guarantee safety for, for the backup of the CBF with uh, time delay and, and uncertainty um, by some argument of, uh, of incremental stability. Um, okay, so just to recap a little bit, uh, previous, the, the, the previous part of my talk shows that if you have control over all the agents, then you can simply just design the protocol and, and, and this, this interaction protocol then, then becomes in the, track, in the form of contracts. Uh, but it requires control authority, obviously. Right? Uh, if you don't control all the agents, then you cannot do that. It requires accurate models. So what about the case where one of several, several, several of your agents in a system is actually human, right? Obviously it's not under control. And, and, and when we think about this problem, we realize that human actually has a fairly good way to, to navigate uh, through this interaction of, of multi-agent systems. For example, this is showing Tokyo's um, a cross role where we are able to infer that uh, what we should do to, uh, to avoid collision uh, with other humans. So, so it's almost like there's some kind of implicit interaction protocol uh, existing among humans. And that motivates us to use data to learn this implicit interaction protocol. And that will be the, the, the theme of the rest of the talk. So actually, let me use a few examples to motiv motivate why we wanna do that. So if you consider the case where somebody asks you to land the plane safely uh, on the crosswind or, um, you know, you want to maintain safe distance uh, from uh, from your your your, your forward vehicle. Then these are actually non-reactive cases in the sense that uh, the wind does not react to how the plane is being piloted, and the forward vehicle does not react to how the how the rear vehicle is driving. Because I know some people actually look back when they drive, but some people don't, right? So you know, when and how they uh, how they brake is independent of the rear vehicle's behavior. So that's why we call it non-reactive case. But if you consider, for example, this, this uh, crossroad in, I think, Ethiopia, 
where there's no traffic light, obviously everybody expect others to react to, to the environment. And that's how they can navigate through this chaos uh, with some confidence of safety. And also, if you think about this, this human that's operating around the robot, obviously this human is reacting to the robot's behavior. So these are the reactive case and how do we quantify what's the worst case, right? For the non-reactive case, it's actually easy because we can simply consider the worst case. For example, the wind, we consider the maximum wind speed. And for the, for the, you know, for the vehicle case, we consider the worst case uh, deceleration. Uh, and, and, the th and, and then I think the key to design safe autonomy when we have you know, multi-agent interaction uh, is to capture this reactivity. So reactivity has been noticed before. Uh, for example, if you look at Pete Troutman's uh, famous fear of, of um, unfreezing robot, and Dorsa has some paper on uh, you know, inverse reinforcement learning to capture reactivity. Uh, and also we have this whole field of human robot interaction. But coming from a, a safety critical background, my, my thinking is a little bit different from the majority of the, of the literature in the sense that uh, most of the papers in the literature, they care about the most likely behavior given the scenario. But I actually care about the set of possible behaviors given the, the scenario, which in which case we can show some safety guarantee. Right? So the idea is we want to learn a mapping from the scenario to the uncertainty set. Um, and immediately two questions gets, get asked. First is what's the, what is the proper representation of this mapping? Because typically in, in machine learning, you, you map a point to a point. And now we, we require mapping from a point to a set. So obviously you have to have, to, you have, to have some parameterization of the, of the set. And the second thing is uh, how reliable is this mapping? Because we depend on safety critical decision-making on, on this model, so it better be reliable. So the first approach that we come up with is a, a classifier approach where uh, the idea is that you, you build a classifier uh, that maps the product of the scenario description, we call it X, um, and the, 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 the disturbance or the, the behavior of the uncontrolled agent, we call it D, uh, to a real number. And then, and then that would tell us whether it's possible or not possible. And then we simply do this, this slicing where it, the idea is that given a scenario, we look at all the D that makes this classifier return a positive number, and that would be our set, right? It's a very, very com convenient way to define a mapping from a point to, to a set. So obviously we collect realistic behavior from, from the reality that captures the behavior of the uncontrolled agents. And there's no reason we have to uh, exclude those behavior because it actually happens in reality. So obviously we have to contain we have to include all these behavior that we observe into this classifier as positive, uh, as possible behavior. So that's like uh, to show you pictorially here. Uh, that's the, uh, the 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 we call a uh, positive data that we collect from from observing the behavior of the uncontrolled agents in in in, in reality. And we want to make sure that our classifier contains all of these points. But can we just use the physical bound, which in which case it actually contains all the, all the positive data, right? Obviously this is a correct one, but it's a useless one because it also includes some really dangerous behavior. Like in this case, this is called a pit maneuver used by the police to, to stop criminals. And you can see that all the behavior by the police car is within this physical bound, right? It, it didn't do something that's supernatural, uh, but as a designer for autonomous vehicles, you don't want to consider these behaviors because it's just too hard and, and it's not really necessary to consider that. Right? So that means there are some unsafe behavior and super unrealistic that we want to exclude from our, from our, from our model. Um, and we actually use falsification tools to systematically generate this kind of behavior. Uh, so the idea is uh, there are tools out there called falsification tools where you give some specification and it will generate the falsifying traces that, that makes the specification uh, wrong. And uh, we, we uh, divide, develop this, this framework that centers around the falsification for where, you know, uh, we start with some positive data and then we use falsification tool to generate some negative data that, that falsifies this, the spec. And we pass both the negative traces and positive traces to the reactive modeling process which is solving a SVM a support vector machine that separates those. And then the cool thing is that we then feed this uh, reactor model back to the falsification tool and say, now you have to find, 
the negative trace that satisfies this, uh, this uh, reactor model. So with this, we can iteratively refine our reactive model um, until either the falsification tool give up and say, hey, we cannot falsify uh, this back anymore, or the reactive modeling give up and say, hey, we cannot separate these two, uh, the, the positive traces and negative traces any better. Uh, and this gu gives guidance to the control sensors in the sense that now if you give me a scenario, this is the uncertainty set that you have to worry about instead of the whole uh, physical limit. And as, as an example, let's consider this, this lane change case where the Thomas vehicle has to, to make a lane change, right? Um, and it has to finish that within, within a, a fixed horizon. So to begin with, uh, the, the falsifier can find this hostile human vehicle behavior where it's basically blocking the human vehicle all the time. And obviously when you have a faulty controller, you have this uh, crashing case, but eventually after we iteratively re refine our reactive model, um, you know, uh, the autonomous vehicle is able to finish the lane change uh, despite the effort by the falsifier to, to falsify that. And uh, also we have some extensions. This is our on ongoing work of using uh, quanta regression. So that is that we have some test functions uh, that maps D to a scalar because we realize that things are much easier you know, when, when, it, when D is a scalar. Uh, and then we use quanta regression to learn the upper and lower bounds. Uh, so this can utilize existing machine learning tools so that it, it's much more powerful uh, than the SVM approach. So here's an illustration of how the test function works. For example, if you use some uh, you know, uh, linear test functions, like in this case, we use three linear fu test functions where the test function is, uh, is a function of D, but then the upper and lower bound we call C, overline C and, and lower line and underline C is actually a function of the scenario. And this is, this is a simple way to create you know, a, a set of D that changes with X. So this is another mapping techniques or parameterization technique that we have. So for example, this is showing the, the example where we have two robots actually. This is the R2D2 where it's un, un, uncontrolled and it's following some black, uh, black box uh, uh, controller, control technique, uh, sorry, control policy. And then we, can, we control the BBA robot that is trying to track this point of interest, but also maintain a, a maximum distance to the, the R2D2. And then in order to define, design a, a controller for the BVA, we have to look at, we have to uh, have a model of the possible uh, velocity of the R2D2 shown here. And this is showing the result of the actual ground truth of the, BB, of the R2D2 um, you know, uh, velocity versus the predicted possible range, uh, which is generated with the, the quantile regression uh, approach. Um, and also we can directly parameterize the future trajectory, which will, will be a more convenient way to, for, for motion, motion planning. Uh, so the idea is that we um, associate some kind of um, uh, uncertainty region so that we can use finite number of traces uh, we can use finite number of trajectories to, to parameterize a whole range of uh, possible trajectories. So this is showing we use 17 uh, trajectories as bases that captures the, the 140,000 trajectories uh, from the NGSN data database by, you know, because each uh, trajectory base, uh, basis trajectory is also associated with some kind of uncertainty region. So it can capture multiple uh, trajectories. And then we use uh, an affordance vector to, de to define what's the scenario. And then we train a neural network that gives us the possible trajectories given the scenario. So this is, show, uh, this is a playback of the NGSIM data where you know, given the surrounding of this, uh, of this red vehicle, we can predict what's the possible trajectories. Um, and with this information, uh, this is showing the, the motion planning result actually using NPC without the reactive modeling in the sense that if all the other agents the, in color blue can do whatever they want, then this, this red vehicle, which is under control, is sort of uh, kind of cornered here. And then if we leverage this reactivity, we can actually uh, demonstrate some kind of really, it's quite ag aggressive, I would say, but also safe behavior. Um, and also this can, this can be applied to power processes where this is showing Obviously, the, the, the set definition is different, the parameterization is different, but 
uh, the idea is quite similar where, where in this case, the uncontrolled agent is actually the human user itself. And we want to capture how the human user is reacting to the proper thesis. And this is showing we use motion capture to estimate the, the interaction force and we find, find a bound that changes with, with uh, the state. And then we use this reactor model for, for the design of, uh, of control for this power thesis. Okay, so I talked about various ways to, to parameterize this, this mapping from, from point to, to a set. And how about the second question, which is how reliable it is, right? And then we actually use uh, RCP theory, which is, uh, stands for uh, random convex uh, programming. And then the idea is, I won't go into detail, but basically the idea is that uh, if we define the risk as the probability that the reactor model is excluding some behavior that is actually possible, uh, then the RCP theory then basically says, as long as your, your positive data is drawn in IID fashion uh, from an unknown distribution, uh, then the risk will decrease with the number of samples used for training, which makes sense, right? Um, and the risk will increase with the complexity of the problem. So if you have a really powerful way to parameterize your mapping, then you're, you're, you're likely to, to overfit essentially. Right? And in the, in, in the classifier approach, uh, because the SVM is, is already a, a, a convex programming, so we can do directly use this RCP theory to prove generalization bound. So this is showing we're giving you know upper bound of, of the risk uh, given given the number of samples used for training and then and then the dimension of the SVM. And in fact, this is actually the reason why we chose SVM in the first place, so that we can use the RCP theory. And for the non convex methods like uh, like a neural network, we can actually do a post processing um, where we can we can still obtain bound on the generalization. Uh, so this is showing you know the the upper bound of the risk given by the RCB theory predicted here versus the empirical result. And you can see that empirical result is always below the RCB bound. Uh, so the idea here is basically use, you, you separate the, your control, your uh, positive data into two parts. Use the first part to train whatever method you use. You can use a neural network, you can use a random forest or whatever. Um, and I use the second one to calibrate, which is a way to robustify your results and we can show that it can, you can actually do that with uh, using convex programming. And that enables us to use RCP to provide this, this uh, generalization bound. Okay, so to, to conclude right today, I talked about multi-agent autonomy and then how, do we, how can we guarantee safety uh, of this complicated uh, autonomous system. Uh, and the key obviously is, is to get an uh, interaction protocol. Um, and for the quantity case, we can actually directly design the protocol and this becomes, uh, a contract right between agents and for, and this enables us to to solve problems like power power, power networks and swarm robots and for uh, uncontrolled agents for for non the, the non property case uh, we use learning to the data driven methods to to learn the protocol in the form of a reactive model and that enables us to solve some problems in, in for example autonomous driving and uh, that's all I want to talk about today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Xiao. Yeah, uh, are there any questions from the audience? And thank you, Xiao. Um, you know, very, very, very nice talk. Uh, a lot of stuff. Um, uh, this is your uh, you, now. This is your postdoc work, right? Uh, or, yeah, mostly, mostly. Some of them started with the, uh, when I was a PhD, but yeah, mostly. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, I have a question on the backup um, uh, policy, right? So you said that you start with an, with a set S zero, right? That is a set that is you know somehow you know has been computed is a positively invariant set, right? Yeah. Controlled, right? Under control. Yeah. Now. And now you compute this other set, you know, the, <laughs> the red, the reddish set, right? So I don't know mm -hmm. what, what you call it. Um, but isn't this a way to compute another set that is positively invariant, right? So then you can, so we well, you know, first of all, it's not clear to me that it's easy to compute this other set. You mean S0? No, the, the red set. Uh, S, okay. 
how, how is that? So is that easy to compute or or not? Yeah. So so we don't have a in, we don't have a close to a uh, close form uh, expression of S. So this S is actually defined as this guy, and it's in the form of um, of this flow map. So obviously we don't we don't have a close close to uh, close form expression of that, but we don't. It turns out we don't need a closed form expression. We can directly use this implicit form in the CBFQP by uh, because we can evaluate what's H by for integrating the dynamics uh, following the backup policy, and we can we, we can evaluate H dot as well. So that's all we need for the for the CBF. Um, that's 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 essentially the idea, right? We're computing a essentially. Yeah. You, you need a way, so you need a way to simulate forward? Yes, yes. That's how you compute it? Yes. Okay, so you need a fast way to simulate that, that forward, right? Until right, you right. get this uh, S, S0, right? Yeah, and we, you have to make sure that, um, that it doesn't get out of S. Correct. So, so we, we forward integrate the dynamics given the, the, the state to mm -hmm. figure out whether we are inside S. And then, and then we also for integrate uh, in the same process. We we also evaluate H dot, the sensitive Jacobian, and then we use these two information for the for the CBFQP. Yeah, and and, and that's actually why I said uh, computation might be an issue because we had to for integrate. Okay. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. And then, and, no, because and, uh, because because you know, for me, <laughs> the question became, you know. If this is easy to compute, then you can use that as a new S zero, yeah, yeah. S one, right? And in yeah. the iterate, right? So uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So so this, so this is still something that is somewhat hard to characterize, right? And right. you have a, a somewhat implicit characterization, and you have to do all these forward simulations and so on and so forth, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. And also there's actually a, a very elegant argument that says, if you use this setting set, the larger set as your S0, of, of course, theoretically you can keep, uh, you know, yeah, expanding yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. And then it turns out it's simply just, just the result of that is simply you, you, you stitch two backup directly. Yeah, 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 two back yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so then that was what I had in mind, right? So if this is easy to characterize then, you know, you have a new S0, right? So you can know, yeah, do yeah, the yeah. same argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, thanks. Great, okay. other questions? Yeah, I have two questions. Go mm -hmm. ahead, Abul Fazl. Uh, so thanks for the nice presentation. So my first question is regarding the SEO guarantee reasoning that you presented. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the approach that you presented could be uh, conservative because you assume uh, actually this, the uh, state of other subsystems are bounded in a, a bounded domain, right? The effects that you are getting from other agents, and uh -huh. the, right? Yeah. Oh, are you talking about this or or the other network example? Yeah, for, for the network example. So oh, okay, okay. once you design it, once to design a controller for your own agents, you assume the effects of other agents are bounded as you yeah. presented. But but uh, but this could be conservative because this, this is the worst case scenario that you are uh, considering. In the same approach that you presented, is there any possibility to uh, go for the similar structure, but instead of decentralized control, we can go for distributed control. We, we have some state information around the agents in parallel and they define some communication channel. This is possible? Yeah, this is possible. So, but it's probably, so we haven't extend this assume guaranteed contract work to that, to enable that, but we have a, another work which is using system level synthesis and then we can show, we can put bound on, on the state and input as well. And, and in, in system level synthesis framework, we actually use like distributed control with communication, um, but, yeah, in our future, we we wanna we also we kind of provide an explanation of whether you can you can you can frame this as also as a as a application of the assumed you can contract and then that involves uh, communication, but it's still not done yet. So in this case, it's it's, it's actually a very simple. I agree, it's a very conservative and simple contract. Yeah, simple um, implementation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so my uh, another question is. Uh, in the compositional approach you presented in the first part of the talk, if, if uh, someone gives you 
an overall uh, safety specification, an overall safe set. So the starting point, point is decomposition of this set or uh, you don't care about the decomposition of the overall set and uh, continue with another approach. So you need to decompose the overall set one, once you are given this set or not. Yeah, you have to decompose that as well. Yeah. So, so, so basically the, you know, the, the, control, the robust control environment that we, that, that we compute here is just the, the Cartesian product of, of individual robust control environments for each node. And if you, don't, if you have a safe set that is kind of defined not as the Cartesian product, then- Yeah, then, exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah this is the to, question, yeah. If, if, if the shape of the set is, is not trivial, so if, if this is complex, so is there any approach to over approximate this by some height or rectangular and continue or no, we are stuck at this point. Yeah, we haven't think carefully about that because I guess when we are given this prob problem, they care about uh, you know the the frequency deviations. So naturally, okay. it's it's a Cartesian product. Uh, but, okay, yeah. So we haven't think this about this. Is the assumption that. that we need? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Great. I see one and up. Uh, um, yeah. See one you. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Yeah. Um, hi, Isha. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. I, I also have a question regarding the ASG, the assumed guarantee uh, contract. Like you said, there is no communication uh, between all of the, the, the agents. And the, um, like, I, I, I'm wondering how do you achieve this, this whole strategy on, online? Like, is there any central server that helps you to solve this problem? Or like, I think, so, I think yeah. So in this case, everything is fully decentralized. There's no communication. You only yeah. look at your, your, your local information. You only look at your own state, actually. Yes. Um, yeah. And that's why, uh, as, um, uh, that's why it's, it's conservative, right? Um, you can do a better job, obviously, if you leverage uh, communication. But in that, in that case, you have to specify the communication protocol also as a part of the student guide contract. And obviously, the student guide contract, contract will become more complicated and, and then that would be a very inter interesting future work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, at some point, I, I realized you, you said uh, controllers could be uh, computed online. Uh, it's not the offline uh, protocol. I mean, I, I didn't get that part, actually. Oh, like, the online part is just solving the CVRQP online. Ah, OK. It's OK. Yeah. It's like you already got the, the uh, ASD yeah, offline. offline. OK, yes, yes. yes. And uh, one more question, please. So I see uh, one of your extensions. You said the decentralized um, uh, framework performs as good as a centralized controller. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a for a different. Uh, this is the, this one. It, it's not a. It's not a yeah, single yeah. kind of contract for, for network system. This is for the backup policy. Yeah. Ah, okay. It's not okay. So yeah, so in yeah. this case, um, you know, we can guarantee that the, the CBF QB is always feasible if the the CBF start to be non-negative. But mm -hmm. in this case, for example, merging, uh, when you when you see the other vehicle coming from the other lane, it's already with a negative um, CBF in the sense that if you if you maintain the current uh, trajectory, they will actually collide. So, yeah. so then we need some kind of communication, and then we, we show an ADMM approach where, where, where um, you can you can look at the paper where where, where we define a special uh, Jacobian ADMM, which is a multi-agent ADMM, mm -hmm. and then we show that the, the the result is almost as good as uh, a centralized CBF or QP that that kind of resolves the conflict. Mm -hmm. So it's LCSS twenty. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Uh, I think we have we are close to be done. But if there is another question, we can take it. Maybe doesn't seem so. Thank you very much, Yushao. It was a Thank great you. talk. Good luck for your further research, um, and um, we'll follow up with the video of the talk. Cool, cool. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. It's, it's a great pleasure to talk to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, see you all. Uh, enjoy your Easter. See you yeah. to the next autonomy talk. Yeah. Bye. Cool. Thank you. Bye. Bye.